Um, so Robert already introduced everything uh, here, but I wanted to show you just a couple of images. This is uh, one of our sampling suites for things that we take back to the lab to analyze. You'll be seeing some plots, and those plots basically came out of these bottles. Okay, so think, think about it that way. Uh, these are some samples or some pictures from being uh, near the creek from Silverbow Creek. This is a drain that is a storm drain. There's some water coming out there. Uh, this is a, a bunch of us out with Joe Griffin who was showing us the location of some of the hydrodynamic devices a long time ago. Very, very cold day. Okay. So today, some of the things that you're going to hear about um, are some of our data uh, that we have collected uh, in the area on zinc, and then fluoride, chloride, and bromide. We have some interesting things going on with these, and I'm not quite sure what, exactly what's going on, but we're going to have a look today. Uh, aluminum as well. Um, we have some evidence for sulfate reduction in a spot we might not expect it. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then a lot of this is geared towards giving us a background for some DNA work that we have extracted and are sitting in boxes and getting sent off. And then we'll have a whole bunch of data to dig deeper into some of these uh, microbial questions uh, that we have. So for those of you that don't know my lab and my research, um, some of the most of the research that we do is actually right here in our own backyard. So um, we've wor done work on the flooded mines in town. We've done work on Upper Silverbow and Blacktail Creeks, all the way down the Upper Clark Fork to Drummond as well. And then we do a lot of research in Yellowstone. So we're interested in water rock interactions and what that does for the microbial habitats in them. So here we are again with our sampling. These are things that are geochemistry that we're taking back to the lab. And then I'm also interested in microbial activity. As you heard from Robert, I have a broad background because I'm interested in biology, geology, and chemistry, and the origin and coevolution of Earth's life and chemistry on Earth. And to do that, you need to know something about biology, geology, and chemistry. Um, if you had to classify me, you could classify me as a geochemist. And my undergrad is you know, geology, so I'm kind of a geologist actually at heart. But interested in things like proteins. So here's a protein. And why I think proteins are awesome and cool is because they represent um, a catalyst and a chemical reaction that if we find these proteins in environmental systems, then we think that that chemical reaction might be occurring. Proteins also link inorganic, so we have some zinc. Uh, ions in this protein to the organic. So they are the link between using metals and environmental um, microbial activity to what's happening with those microbes in these systems. Okay, so today you're mostly going to be hearing about some of the data um, that we have right up here. So in the upper part of Butte, um, and then our control site is kind of up the hill a little bit uh, over here. So all along uh, down here. And then we also sample all the way to Drummond, but you won't be hearing about those data uh, today. Let's kind of flip this in space because I like to think with, you know, north to the north. So if you're thinking about it that way, then this is actually the orientation in space for those geologists out there. All right. So what's been happening in our environment where we live up here? Well, this is a picture of the Never Sweat uh, mine in Butte uh, around 1900. So we got this uh, off of the SeaTech website. And um, we have impacts from the fact that there are tailings as well. And then also we have you know, all of this smelting, which did a good job of distributing you know, elements throughout the environmental systems. So here we are at the headwaters uh, of the upper Clark Fork, which goes all the way to the Columbia, which goes all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And what sort of impacts do we have? Well, we have historical mining operations. We still have our you know, Berkeley pit, and we have you know, active mining operations uh, as well, still here today. Our groundwater, which we can sample, um, in conjunction with the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology, we can get data from beneath and what is our groundwater like in Butte. This is from Renee Schmidt's thesis in uh, 2017. So you'll be hearing about sites like Santa and Slag Canyon and the KOA um, on Silver Bow Creek today uh, in the talk. Okay, here's an example of out sampling when it's cold, and this is Upper Silver Bow Creek here. Um, in, in, a winter, in the winter time, when there's actually some flow in here. This site doesn't always have flow. It is sometimes dry, so sometimes we have to skip this one when we're out sampling. Uh, these are the samples that we focus on in the Butte Priority Soils uh, Operable Unit, which is um, right shown in here on the graph. And then we have a site that is just below the operable unit as well to get everything 
that goes down that way. And then we have Silver Bow Creek and Blacktail Creek where they come together. And then we're interested in a, one of the drains for stormwater that is over in this direction. And then our control site is way up near Thompson Park okay, when we look at the look at this. So we've been sampling these six sites basically every three months and we started in November 2015. Uh, we did not start sampling the control until May of 2016, but we've sampled it every month or every three months with this set of samples since 2015 of November. So um, it's 2018 now, so we're getting a good data set going. All right, these are two samples. Um, we saw this picture already of Upper Silver Bow Creek. This is down by Montana Street, which by the slag walls, right, which we see, which we call Slag Canyon. Here's an undergraduate, Jordan Foster, collecting a sediment cup there, a sterile specimen cup with sediment for microbial analysis. Okay. Um, what also happens sometimes uh, at our sites is, you know, storm water. So sometimes when we're sampling, you know, flow is high, November 2015. And then sometimes when we're going out to sample, it's low. So this is a, the drain by the Quality Inn. And here it is high 2015 and kind of low in August 2016. So difficult to sample there. All right. So that's a little bit about... Um, the area that we're uh, interested in, but then I wanted to tell you a little bit about microbes. So microbes are everywhere. You can find them pretty much anywhere from, you know, hot springs to this tabletop right here. We're going to find microbes. And they are an important and vital part of any ecosystem. And they're an important and vital part of a healthy uh, ecosystem uh, as well. And so when we sample for geochemistry, we also sample for microbiology so that we can know if our ecosystem is healthy as well as, you know, do calculations for microbes microbial activity in terms of geochemical um, availability of energy for organisms. All right, so microbial habitats. Let's frame where we are here uh, in Butte. So this is temperature from 0 to like 140, so or below 0 to 140. So these are temperatures we would experience on Earth in places. Uh, boiling is over here, 100. Yellowstone, it's 92.5 at the elevation of Yellowstone. And then pH values go from 0. Um, I don't have some of our most alkaline samples on Earth are like 11.5. They're from Oman. And actually, the most acidic samples on Earth are Iron Mountain, California, with a pH of minus 3 in some of those areas, which is pretty wild. Um, but today, we're talking about up here uh, with our upper Silver Bow, um, well, there are Silver Bow and Blacktail Creeks. So you yourself, you are, your blood is a pH of 7.4 and 37 Celsius, so you're kind of hanging out here. You've got acid in your stomach, which is, you know, kind of down here. Okay. So plots for microbial habitat uh, on Earth. All right, so let's look at some data now. So. These are the results from November 2015 to, um, I guess, uh, didn't get our current sampling in here, but uh, August 2018. So these are uh, variations in pH on Silver Bow and Blacktail Creeks uh, when we're sampling them once uh, every three months. So we're pretty much well within EPA aquatic life zone, except for this one. This was a little pile of water in uh, Upper Silver Bow Creek uh, the first time we sampled it, low pH, kind of sitting there, probably precipitating out copper um, at that point. So this is, this is pretty good. Uh, we expect temperature variations, so it's colder down here. So we, this is more February sampling, and then November sampling can be here, although this November sampling this past weekend, we were down here, at, uh, everything was like 2 degrees Celsius. It was pretty cold. May sampling temperatures around here. August sampling, we tend to be uh, over here with our temperatures. Okay, so this is pretty good, pretty cool. We're okay with this. Uh, these are the samples that we have extracted for DNA and they're sitting in vials and we're actually finalizing the list and they should get shipped out tomorrow or the next day um, to get sequenced. So uh, this is the same plot that you saw before, except these are the stars where we have extracted DNA. We've extracted DNA from um, starting from November 2015 samples throughout a full year cycle. So what are we going to get from this DNA? Well, we're going to get uh, metagenomes from this DNA. So we're going to sequence every little piece of DNA that we can find 
in any one of those locations, and then we can look at that DNA and see what organisms are in it and what processes that they could be capable of performing um, in that DNA. So that'll tell us uh, what organisms are there and that'll tell us how healthy uh, the ecosystem is soon. So soon we'll have more data than we can deal with, but it'll take a couple of months for those results to come back. Okay. So when we go out and make these charts, how do we do it actually? Well, we do in situ measurements of dissolved oxygen, pH, conductivity, and temperature with meters. So we go out there and that day we have those data, okay? We also get some reactive species that we can't really bring back to the lab to measure. We have to measure them while they're out there because they change. And so those are dissolved silica, um, iron two, ferrous iron, uh, total dissolved sulfide, and also not on here, we've been measuring for ammonia and ammonium uh, as well out in the field. And we do this with wet chemical tests. So we mix together some chemicals and they change colors and we use a spectrophotometer in the field, kind of hidden behind all this stuff here. Uh, to say, okay, that's dark blue, we have this much sulfide, for example. And then we um, take back those, um, you've seen the bottle with the filters dripping in, we take back those samples to get a full suite of chemistry. And with this full suite of chemistry, we can look at things individually and we can start to model uh, speciation as well. So one of my students has worked on modeling the speciation uh, in the creek. Won't talk too much about that today, but that's what he's doing. So we get major cations, anions, trace elements, dissolved inorganic carbon, dissolved organic carbon, um, oxygen, hydrogen, isopes, and water. We collect a vial for organic acids, but we haven't analyzed that yet, but we'll get the capacity to do that eventually. So these are the things we take back to the lab to get information. To characterize microbial life, we both filter water to get the organisms that are living in the water on the filter, and then we can extract DNA from that filter, as well as in the sediment. So in the sediment column, um, just the, below the water column where we sample, we take a sample from that, and we can extract DNA to get what microbes. We can extract protein to get metabolic activity. These things get frozen at minus 80, so everything is just dead when we freeze it. And then we save some at um, four degrees Celsius for culturing, um, in case we see something interesting, we can try to grow organisms uh, out of that. And we've got some, uh, Jordan here has actually grown some interesting things um, out of the creek. I think they've since died, but they were cool um, at one point when we had them growing. Okay, so let's look at some chemistry now. And we're gonna see some chemistry from a couple of these different areas uh, as well. So there'll be some Yellowstone for reference, some flooded mines for reference, um, and some upper Clark Fork for reference in with the silver bow. And then we'll also focus in on silver bow and blacktail creeks. All right, so uh, boron is something that in most systems or like uh, hydrothermal systems like Yellowstone, we kind of use it as an indicator of increasing water rock reaction. So the more boron that we find in some of these hot springs, the more we think that that water has interacted with the rock, uh, getting the boron uh, in there. And so what we actually see is kind of interesting where our silver bow and blacktail creeks um, actually kind of have a variation um, in the boron, which if this was a hydrothermal system, we would think about water rock reaction and that may or may uh, not be the case. So there might be increased surface area for reaction because of tailings or um, other factors. So comparing silver bone blacktail creeks in the cyan here to butte flooded mines to Yellowstone to Upper Clark Fork here. So there's evidence of some water rock reaction you know, in these systems. Uh, zinc. So here are some data for zinc from lots of the different areas. Uh, we don't really care about the EPA aquatic life limit in hot spring systems, um, but we are concerned with the EPA aquatic life uh, limit in other systems like the rivers, Upper Clark Fork, and the Silver Bow um, and Blacktail Creeks. And so kind of that is uh, where we are. Notice that some of the mines actually have pretty high zinc um, in them uh, underneath uh, Butte here. Okay, let's zoom in. So we're gonna zoom in on our um, Silver Bow and Blacktail Creeks. So Silver Bow and Blacktail Creek samples that we have are now in blue. And then our control, which is also Blacktail Creek, but way up above uh, town. So what we actually see uh, is that sometimes, um, you know, we have sites, you know, in Butte and around Butte that are actually, you know, higher than the control. Um, so that shows that there's been um, more of this 
in Silverbow and Blacktail Creeks down here than there is uh, up, up on Blacktail, way up high on the creek. All right, another interesting thing that kind of came out, I started, I only, you're like, well, why would she look at bromine? Uh, well, I started looking at bromine because Isaiah did an experiment, you'll see some of his data a little bit later, and he started to get weird things happening with bromine, which is kind of bizarre. So that's why I started plotting up uh, bromine. But what we see here is that our control, it's usually at our detection limit up there. So there isn't any bromine uh, in the water uh, as bromide. but Silverbow and Blacktail Creeks have some. And then in red is one site, Slag Canyon. So down by Montana Street there, that one is in red. And what we see is that sometimes uh, Slag Canyon has measurable bromine, and then sometimes it actually doesn't. And we'll look at this plot again when we uh, look at some of Isaiah's experiments um, on photosynthesis that he performed in the creeks. So this is uh, interesting. So we are higher with bromide in Butte Area 1 and slightly below than we are with the control higher up. We also see a similar trend uh, with fluoride. So sometimes fluoride is a little bit higher here um, in town than it is up above town in some areas. And we can look closer uh, at this. Uh, chlorine also looks similar, but I didn't put it up there because we don't need to look at too many plots. All right, so our halogens um, are slightly elevated um, in the area here than they are compared to up above town at Thompson Creek, at Thompson Park. All right, now we're zooming out a little bit and we're thinking about uh, aluminum. So uh, aluminum uh, as an ion, here we are in town, kind of going down uh, the upper Clark Fork here. So uh, as an oceanographer, when we think of aluminum in oceanography, we think of dust inputs, like dust inputs from the Sahara into the North, into the North Atlantic. That's what we look at aluminum for. Uh, but here, um, that's not exactly uh, what we might be thinking. But um, this is plotted up on the scale over here on the right. So more aluminum is in red, uh, less aluminum uh, is in blue. And so we see differences along the upper Clark Fork in where aluminum is coming in uh, or not. And the aluminum in town in the Butte Area 1 um, is similar to the control or even lower. And it's well below the EPA aquatic life limit for aluminum. So everything seems well in the world of aluminum. Okay. All right. So that was a little bit about some of the geochemical trends that we've been noticing so far uh, in some of our data. And now I want to show you a little bit about what Isaiah has done this summer um, on photosynthesis in Silverbow Creek. So this is a master's student who will be writing everything up um, and graduating in the spring. So Isaiah, um, as a scientist, came to, you know, called me up or wrote me an email and then we talked on the phone and he's like, you know, I'm interested in eutrophication and nutrients and streams and all that. I'm like, okay, well, we can figure something out. So uh, this, that is his underlying um, motivation for looking at this work is looking at nutrients and what organisms are living in the creek and what that means for other organisms uh, as well. So he designed this experiment where he said, all right, I'm gonna have my experiment in triplicate in one liter bottles and I'm gonna put some slides in and see if I can see what organisms are growing in the creek. I'm gonna bottle this stuff at the beginning of the experiment, initial, and then I'm gonna measure as I go along and then I'm gonna harvest it. So I'm gonna leave this in the creek for, it ended up being 23 days. And then he's like, well, I'm interested in what light is doing for photosynthesis. So he shaded one box to like 5% transmittance of light, and then one box is like 50% transmittance of light, and then one box is clear, and it's getting all of the light, and he tried to look at what differences he saw um, in these experimental bottles. Okay, so that is his uh, initial question. So he's wondering what light is doing to photosynthesis and what nutrients are limiting um, photosynthesis in Silverbow and Blacktail Creeks, and if any metals are toxic. So we don't have results from the metals back yet because the ICPMS has been down over at the Bureau for a little bit, but we will have metal results um, probably in the next month when Jackie gets everything figured out. Oh, I meant to take this out. Okay, but this is, <laughs> sorry, this is just, we'll see the creek again really quick. Um, but these are, these are Isaiah's experimental sites. So he did um, Santa, he did Slag Canyon, he did 
uh, KOA, um, and then he did a control up at Thompson Creek. And so he has some nice pictures. We already kind of looked at some of these sites. Um, but this is Santa Claus Road, where it crosses the creek. Isaiah had an experiment in here this summer. Uh, this is Slag Canyon. Isaiah had an experiment in there, one of those boxes, or three of those boxes. And then he had one also at the KOA. And then he had one way up near Thompson Park. Okay, so these are his four experimental sites. All right, so what did he find? Um, well, at Slag Canyon, this is an example of what his results look like. So he put them in, he did some experiments before he started measuring to know how long it was going to take for these to grow. Dark means the dark box, gray means you know that medium box, and light means the light box. And so what he saw here was that the dark box didn't really grow photosynthetic stuff. So time and days on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have in vivo chlorophyll fluorescence and relative fluorescence units. And what that means is he took a little sample and he put it in the fluorometer and then saw how much chlorophyll was in it. So very easy measurement for tracking about how much biomass is in there. So he saw that the uh, medium box kind of grew almost as much as the light box, but the light box reached the highest maximum, um, and then the dark box didn't really grow much at all at Slag Canyon in terms of chlorophyll. Okay. Uh, these are normal air bars for biological experiments. It usually happens when two of your bottles stay the same, and then something weird happens with one of your bottles, and then you get really big air bars. There's not a lot you can do about it. It happens. Um, but this is what he saw. All right. And I'm showing you this um, because it gets a little bit interesting with uh, macronutrients. So macronutrients, um, these organisms need nitri nitrate um, and phosphorus uh, as well to grow. So these green bars are his initial experiment. So he went to the creek, you know, took a bucket, um, did a full sample on the bucket, and put the water into his bottles to start his experiment. And this is what he started with um, for nitrate. And then this other, these other bars are his, um, um, how much nitrate was in at the end when he pulled his experiment. And so what we actually see is we see drawdown in these nutrients, like you might expect in most all of the sites, uh, except for uh, Thompson, it kind of you know, stayed the same, uh, a little bit of drawdown there uh, as well. And then that dark box at Slag Canyon went, didn't have a lot of drawdown, but organisms still use some of that nitrate in there, but they probably weren't photosynthetic. Another nutrient that organisms need is phosphate, right? So same thing, but this time we notice that phosphorus is drawn down to detection limit in every single bottle for all of the treatments. So these organisms were probably limited for phosphorus, and so they, this means that they used all the phosphorus first and then they were you know, using nitrogen. So these organisms got limited by the fact that they used all their phosphorus, and so then you couldn't get any more growth uh, in these bottles uh, here. So we see drawdown to zero in everything except the dark box up at Thompson. Okay. All right, this is where it starts to get uh, interesting, because we might expect phosphorus to be limiting. But here's a picture of Isaiah's boxes you know, in the creek. Uh, during his experiment. And then what we see here is, so sulfate is a you know, intermediate nutrient. Um, everything needs a little bit of sulfur in, in their metabolism. But what we see is a lot of these are similar to the initial. And except for Slag Canyon dark box, all of that sulfate got drawn down. And um, this kind of suggests to us that there was some other process happening in that dark box. So some of the nitrogen was drawn down, all the phosphorus was drawn down. It wasn't photosynthetic. So we are suspecting that maybe there's actually sulfate reduction happened, sulfate reduction happened in that bottle in the water column. So that would suggest that there might be sulfate reducing bacteria that are actually living in the water column. Um, at Slag Canyon, which is interesting and requires a little bit more uh, investigation at what is going on there. We can look at this in a couple of different ways, too. Um, when we get metagenome data back, we can look for SOX, or sulfide oxidation and reduction types of genes that will tell us if this process is happening. And then the other thing that we can do is 
when we extract DNA from these, we can just take a tiny, tiny bit of the DNA and we can run a polymerase chain reaction, a PCR reaction, using the primers for those genes involved in that process. And then we can say, oh, look, those genes are in there. They might be doing that process. So um, that's interesting that that's happening at Slide Canyon in the dark box. Okay. All right. So that's a mystery that isn't solved yet. That's an open question that came out of Isaiah's experiment. And then this other, there's something else going on. So halogens are getting drowned out, and we're not sure why. So um, this is uh, chloride, and basically, this is the rest of this is all very normal. Yeah, that looks cool. Okay, they're kind of the same chloride. But here, again, that Slag Canyon dark box, all of this chlorine is drawn down in that box. So that suggests that the organisms are taking up all of this chlorine, which doesn't make a lot of sense or isn't you know, necessarily what organisms would normally do. So, also a mystery to solve. So then we're like, okay, well, let's check out uh, what's happening with bromine. Well, even kind of weirder, um, we don't really know what anyone would be, what anyone by organisms would be doing with bromine, but bromine is pretty much drawn down uh, at Slag Canyon and KOA to the detection limit. There wasn't any bromine at Thompson to start with, but all of these other ones, they're taking up bromine. So there's something interesting going on with halogens um, at each of these locations in the creek. Okay, so taking us back to, remember uh, this plot with um, our bromide ion on the y-axis, pH on the x-axis, Slag Canyon right here uh, is in red. And so basically, depending on the season and depending on the initial bromine concentration, there's weird, some strange sort of halogen metabolism likely going on with the microbes uh, in this part of the creek at particular times. And I don't know why yet. So open question. All right. So these were some of the things that Isaiah thought about when he was doing his experiment. He thought that light would be the predominant limitation. He thought that the maximum chlorophyll fluorescence would be higher with more light. He did not find that, so he saw some maximum fluorescence, but he didn't think it was higher with more light. Um, he thought that light limitation would not allow full use of nutrients. His hypothesis was rejected. Uh, they drew down all the phosphorus in uh, the bottles, no matter what they were. And then Light, is it the predominant limitation? Not so sure. We're still trying to figure that out from the data that we got from his experiment. And then we do agree that phosphorus is the most limiting nutrient. It was drawn down in all of the bottles um, in his experiment. Okay. So th these were some of the things that came out of uh, Isaiah's experiment this summer. All right. So a little bit on microbial. So I've been telling you that DNA is interesting and that protein is interesting, but here is why it's interesting. Um, you'll see when you're reading um, a genome, a transcriptome, and a proteome, that usually refers to one type of organism. And so one organism grown in culture would have a genome, and at any given time it would have a transcriptome, and at any given time it would have a proteome. The contents of its transcriptome and its proteome would be dependent upon is it living, is it dying, is it stressed uh, or not, that changes. The genome stays the same. Okay. If you're looking at environmental samples, so somebody goes to the environment, takes a scoop of something, that any DNA would be a metagenome, any transcriptome would be a metatranscriptome, and a proteome would be a metaproteome. So we're interested in metagenome and metaproteome. So people have gotten good at doing metagenomes now. This is kind of difficult. RNA is hard to work with. And then metaproteome is interesting because it's telling us what is the microbial activity at these sites. So DNA represents metabolic potential. What could happen in a system? The transcriptome is what proteins are being made at the time that you extract the um, RNA. And then the metaproteome is telling us what proteins are actually present. And so this means that we have metabolic activity. What is the cell actually doing at a given time? And metabolic uh, potential ecosystem health. So um, we might be able to use our, RNA, our DNA um, and our protein data to tell us why are these organisms taking up bromine? Or why is the dark box taking up 
uh, chlorine? Or why are the organisms reducing sulfate at this particular uh, location? Okay, I wanted to give you an example of some of the microbial data um, that can come out. Um, let's, we're gonna look at some data from some of the mines from Rene Schmidt's thesis here. And so uh, this is where water is going into the Berkeley pit and water over here is going towards uh, the creek. And some of the data that we would get back from, so this isn't a metagenome, but this is basically a 16S or an 18S analysis. So 16S and 18S are conserved genes that you have, that microbes have, that everybody has. And so we can take people's 16S genes and look for and see um, what they are and see what organism it is based on that 16S gene. And so because it makes protein, everybody needs it, and so it doesn't change very much. And so based on doing looking at that one gene, we can tell that these organisms um, are in the mines. So these are from the different mines around Butte. And what we noticed with Renee's data when she was doing her thesis was that the Ophir has a different uh, microbial signature. So we haven't followed up on this um, any more, but we've talked with Gary over at the Bureau. And so we think there's actually mixing of surface water that's happening at the Ophir to give it this different microbial signature compared to the other mines. So that tells us something about the water. Um, these are archaea, so these are bacteria. And then these are archaea. We also see <coughs> a different signature uh, in the Ophir compared to the other mines. So that's one gene. And soon we'll have lots of different genes from uh, all of these locations in the creek. All right. So what we've been trying to do is look at rock water microbe interactions. How does the rock um, make the water? livable for microbes and what are the microbes you know, doing to the water in order to link microbial activity uh, with the geochemistry in a wide variety of systems. So we looked at data today from Upper Silver Bow Creek um, and Upper Clark Fork, or sorry, Upper Silver Bow Creek and, well, and Blacktail Creek. And then uh, I've showed you a little bit of example data you know, from some of the mines. And this is a picture uh, of the Upper Clark Fork, so we also have uh, data from that as well. I'm not going to tell anyone about some of the work that Robert and I have been uh, working on together. Uh, we should have that stuff kind of finished up, hopefully have uh, that stuff worked out for you guys for next semester, where we have, uh, we're looking at hyperaccumulation of metals uh, in native plants up there. All right, so hopefully, some of the things that you got from uh, this today was that these elements, zinc, fluoride, chloride, uh, and bromine as bromide, are slightly elevated in the uh, Butte Area 1 uh, in, the, in the water there, and as well as just below it, compared to a creek that is, Blacktail Creek that is higher up and out of the area. Uh, aluminum is the same or similar levels between the area here in Butte and the site that is uh, above upstream of town. We've got some interesting uh, evidence for sulfate reduction that could be happening in the dark um, in the water column uh, at Slag Canyon here on Montana Street um, right next to the road there in the creek. And then we have a full set of DNA extracted from one full seasonal cycle of uh, Butte Area 1 and the control to be sent off for sequencing. So we'll be able to link some of these processes that we are being hinted at with our geochemical data and we'll be able to link it with what microbes are actually there and what we think these microbes could actually be doing um, in these systems. Okay, um, we're not going to go through these wordy take-home messages, but we talk about microbes being parts of the system. All right, so to get all this stuff done, 
uh, it takes a, a whole group of us uh, going out there. And so we go out as a group for whoever's project it is you know, that we're working on. And we take all of these samples. So we do the meter readings, and we do collect the water, and we collect the microbial um, sample that gets frozen and taken back to the lab uh, for analysis. But um, Renee, Shanna, and Georgia have graduated out of the lab doing projects on the mines here. And Georgia developed a procedure for looking at dissolved chemistry uh, in mud pots. Shanna did some really cool modeling with a some basically looking at rock composition from a drill core in Yellowstone and then the, water, the hot spring composition and then rainwater composition and did some modeling for water rock interactions between um, water and the rocks at Yellowstone heated up to high temperatures. And then uh, currently we have um, Isaiah and Jonathan who have been working on the creek sampling. Uh, we saw some data from Isaiah's experiment looking at photosynthesis this past summer and Jonathan has some good speciation data that didn't get incorporated uh, into this today. So he took all of those data that we collect and he looked at what species, what chemical species are most likely to be present um, uh, at each location for each metal. So if it's copper, is it copper? Is it copper oxide? You know, for example. Um, Nathan and Kyle started this year. And Nathan is interested in something to do with Yellowstone. And then Kyle's interested uh, in Alpine Lakes. Uh, Jordan has done lots of different projects over the past four years. And he's going to be writing up some of his Yellowstone stuff, I think, for his uh, thesis. OK. Also doing this work takes um, a lot of people that are involved. So these are people that have you know, helped us out with getting samples or analyzing samples or gone, going out in the field with us or uh, various different uh, ways of supporting uh, our work uh, in the lab. And our research, uh, most of the stuff that you've seen today, the Creek work is funded by the Natural Resource Damage Program, and it got started with uh, grants from the Montana Water Center, Montana University System, and Montana Institute on Ecosystems, as well as internal types of funding from Montana Tech to get our work started. And then my Yellowstone work has been funded by NASA for the past couple of years as well. So that's where we get the money to do the work that we, we do so far. OK, so uh, with that, I would like to open it up for discussion and questions, and we can go back to different plots if I went through any of them too fast. Okay. <laughs>